ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Biologist Merrick Ekins has cycled across Mongolia and met wily Mongolian horses. He's driven through Africa and come face to face with hippos and hyenas. But the creatures which fascinate Merrick more than any other don't live on the land. They live thousands of metres below us on the deepest ocean floor, sea sponges. These brainless, beautiful animals were around long before the dinosaurs. In fact, they have a claim to be the earliest animals. So they are, you know, our great-great-whatever great-grandparents. Merrick is the collection manager of Cecil Marine Invertebrates at the Queensland Museum, and he is Australia's foremost expert on carnivorous sponges. Yes, there is such a thing. Hello, Merrick. Hello, Sarah. Your official title, as I say, is to be in charge of the collection of Cecil Marine Invertebrates. Now, marine and invertebrate, I have a sense of, but what does the word Cecil mean? Yeah. Am I even saying it the right way? No, you're saying it right. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? It basically means the ones that are attached to the ground, attached to corals or the reef or something like that, or the mud, rather than invertebrates that swim around, like crabs and prawns. So things like sponges is one example. Yeah. What other things and count? Cor- hard corals, soft corals, ascidians, bryozoans. So the, like these kinds of creatures, like sea sponges, I guess they don't have the immediate glamour of a dolphin or, or a chimpanzee. So when you tell someone, you know, at a on a plane or at a party that, you're a specialist in sponges, how do they tend to react? Yeah, you're right. It definitely doesn't fit in the category of charismatic megafauna. (laughs) And it's always hard to convince politicians or the public to give you funding to work on them. Well, it's easy to tell them about carnivorous sponges. That always usually gets them hooked. Do scientists know exactly how long sponges have been around on the planet? Oh, about half a billion years. So a long time. So they're They've got some good processes there to keep them alive. How do we even know that? I mean, I think of a sponge as something soft. How does it even stay in the in the fossil record? Yeah, well, most sponges have a silicon-based skeleton, not all of them, but most of them. And so glass um, preserves really well in the fossil records. They uh, are considered animals, or they are animals, which surprised me, Merrick, as a non-scientist, because they don't move around, they don't have brains. Why are they counted as animals? Well, well, there's a whole whole bunch of things that define difference between animals and plants, and one of them is having big cell walls, which really defines plants. So that's one of the reasons why they say, for, for many years, for hundreds of years, people put them in plants as well, then eventually they went, no, they're actually animals. You're right, they don't move, and they don't have a brain, as we know it, but that's our, our way of thinking as a human. But I think of an animal as needing a brain. So how, how, is, that, how is there an animal with that well, complex system without well, a brain? Yeah, well, there are lots of different complex systems that we just don't understand how they work. There used to be this classic sponge experiment where you get a sponge and if you basically blend it up into all of your individual cells, obviously you've got to keep it in the right conditions, and then you leave it settling enough, the cells were, used to come together and then it'd reform into the sponge basic shape. I mean, so it does that without a brain, but, but humans, if you put them through a blender, they're not very good at putting themselves <laughs> back together again. There oh. are experiments that don't get approval from yeah, the right, health and safety department. Depa- that's right. No that. <laughs> and what role do they have in, in the ocean if we think about them as part of that bigger ecosystem? What makes sea sponges so important for the rest of the seas? Well, if we didn't have things like um, sponges and soft corals and cidians in the ocean, they do all the filtering, all our oceans would be a brown colour. You wouldn't have that beautiful clear water we do. So they're incredibly important in that part of it. They're basically garbage cleaners out of the oceans. So tell me more about what it is that makes one of these creatures distinctive. They don't have a skeleton the way that I would think of one, but they've got spicules. Yeah. What are they? Spicules are the silicon basis. And they're most of the time they're like 0.1 of a millimetre in size, but there is one species where the silicon spicule is over a metre long, and that's down the bottom of the ocean. Because there's 150 times more silicon at the bottom of the ocean there is at top, so you get more of these glass sponges down the bottom, and so they use they make these spicules ba- basically to give them a skeleton to hold them up, but they also it, I think they turn out to be very good defensive things. And the case of carnivorous sponges, they've used them for a different purpose. Can the shape of those change over time? Like in a different in, if it's put in a different environment, does yeah. that that shape change? The sponge itself um, have very plastic shapes. 
they, they might be encrusting on a rock in a high turbid environment and then if they're in a nice place where it's getting good water flow and they're nice and safe and structured, they might form a nice candelabra formation. So there's only a few species of sponges that you can tell by the shape. The rest of them, it's, it's unfortunately, it's looking under the microscope at the, at the spicules. Yeah, and for sponges, there's not you don't have like a bird book you can flip through or a book of shells and go, oh, that's one there. Everything has to be done. You have to make sections and look under a microscope or a scan electron microscope and DNA to try and work out what it is. So, so as you say, it's carnivorous sponges which can get the most interest or um, attention for those of us who don't have the detailed love and knowledge of sea sponges that you have. Before you explain to me what makes these sponges different, Tell me how it is that most sponges get their food. Yeah, most sponges are filter and they've and and all of the cells are little little um, flagella and they cause the motion of they suck in water and spit it out and then they filter out the food particles out of the ocean. Whereas carnivorous sponges have used these spicules, like exaptation is called, where that that's what we don't think they were designed for, but they decided, oh, these are actually good at hooking and catching little animals. They're like shaped like anchors and little fish hooks. So you get these little tiny crustaceans that walk along and they get snagged. And then what the sponge does, it, it makes some of its cells into a digestive cell and digests it on the spot. What do you mean it just transforms yeah, those well, cells in the moment? Yeah, well, probably not in a moment, but um, all sponge cells are totipotent. That is, they're like the original stem cells. So a sponge can just, it's, each cell can then go, okay, I was a flagella before, but now I'm going to turn into a digestive organism and such like that. You know, they're... They're half a billion years far, far, further ahead of us in terms of stem cells. So some sponges have just developed this ability all without a brain directing it. That's right. When did scientists first realise that there were sponges that were, you know, catching little wayward crustaceans and being carnivorous? How long have scientists oh, known no. that? Yeah, that was only recent. That was only done in the late early 90s or late 80s, I think. Um, yeah, by, in, and they found it in a shallow water cave in in France, actually, it was it was well, it's about fifty meters deep, but it's a special shaped cave that traps all this cold water. So it's sim- it's basically simulating what's happening at, at much deeper depths, because the carnivorous sponges usually live at deep depths where there's less food they can filter, and they have to rely on catching things as food as well. So yeah, it was a recent discovery, but they did they did discover these and describe some of these sponges from the Challenger expedition back in the eighteen hundreds but they didn't realise they were carnivorous at the time. How would scientists first realise that that's what they were doing? Would it have been observing them in location or bringing them back to an aquarium? Uh, Bringing them back and then finding they've got um, crustaceans. But over in France, they do have, someone's got them in the fridge in the lab. They've got the shallow water ones and you can, you you can feed the crustaceans and you see them get caught. (laughs) So is it, is it like, I don't know, like the the Venus flytrap? Is there an analogy like that? Yeah, no, it's not as dynamic as the Venus flytrap. It's more like sundews, you know, all the carnivorous sundew plants. No, they're in the rainforest and around around Brisbane. You get them, they're little red ones, but the size 50 cent piece and they've got little um, sticky knobs on them. And so when insects want along, they get, they get caught more. So that's how it is. The same thing with the carnivorous sponges. So tell me more, Merrick, about where these sponges are found in the ocean. How far deep do you, do you have to go to find them usually? Yeah, normally normally a kilometre down to four kilometres down. So it's got they, they need cold temperature and they've got to compete in a different way, in a different sort of environment up there. So the shallow water sponges have to compete against corals and, and other photosynthesizing things as well. And they have all this chemical warfare going on for space. But um, further further down the slope, there's less competition for that. But then you also have this snow, all the carbonate basically from reefs all drifts down. And it's like you imagine a mountain in Switzerland with black-sided mountains and then snow hanging on the top of every top, the top of every every sort of shelf it can. And it looks exactly like that underwater. So a lot of these things either have to hang underneath an overhang or just coming out and they have to get rid of, be, have abilities to get rid of the snow, clear themselves off as well. So the sponge is like living in a little shelter away from that falling snow? Most of them are. Some of them are not. Some of them live in the snow and keep cleaning themselves, but yeah. If they're so far down, way, 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 way down deep, how do scientists study them? I mean, do you go down that far? Surely that's not possible. I'd love to. Yeah, there are some, but I haven't been invited on one of those. Well, how are they collected, these sponges? Well, there's two different study. ways of collecting in the past, which would have been to put a beam trawl out, and we did that in the investigator um, in 2017. Because you're going down four kilometres, you've got to have like eight 
kilometres worth of steel cable out to hold your little trawler on the bottom. And then you've got to find a, a spot like a runway at the bottom that you can land this thing on because there's, there's like rocks and mountains and things you want to avoid. And so there's a whole lot of complex trigonometry trying to, trying to land this thing on the bottom so you can run along and pick it up and then you haul it up. So it takes, you know, by the time you reel in eight kilometres, it takes, takes another three hours to get back on the boat. But they've also got ROVs. What's an ROV? A remote operator vehicle. So it's basically an a underwater robot and it's controlled by a tether from the mothership. So we had the Smithsonian Institute had their Falcor boat out here a few years ago and so we're using the Sebastian on top of that and it's got fantastic pilots driving this thing. And, and how, was, how big is it? About the size of a, a caravan. And it gets sent down and to the bottom of down, the seafloor. Yep. And they've got fantastic cameras on. It's got these robotic arms. And I was in my, because it was during COVID, so I was in my office in Brisbane and by satellite I was talking to the guys on the boat and, that, and I had a live screen from their cameras and I'm going, no, no, go left. No, that little one there, go and grab that one. And <laughs> so they're really fantastic and manipulate it with the arm or a little suction device and they, um, they suck it up and then it moves into a little tray and they store it there. We did, we did have on a previous expedition many years ago, we had this unfortunate thing where we got these deep water crinoids, which are super rare, and, and they picked them up on the robot, put them in a basket, then they want to grab something else. And as I opened the basket to grab something else, the jets from the <laughs> propellers, the wash, and the they crinoids floated, floated off. off into the empty darkness, never to ever be seen oh, again. Oh, no, <laughs> no. And some side poor scientist is watching this all happen. Yeah, on... we were. We were all watching it going, no. Nah. <laughs> never saw them again. <laughs> well, I mean, does it have to be in certain conditions for this to work? I mean, what if there are currents or whatever down at the bottom of, of the ocean? Yeah, that that's, affect that's it? why the boats are moving in 2D space. They're moving sideways all the time. The, the, the mothership is moving constantly because sometimes you might be, the reef might be over there, so you can't park the boat on the reef, obviously. And then you've got the cable going down, the tether, and if that's going down a couple of kilometres, there's a lot of current blowing, blowing machines, so they're trying to drive this machine. And sometimes you go, you've got to move the boat backwards or forwards. <laughs> this is making the thing my under. stress around reverse parking, you know, put this in, in the shade compared yeah. to having to, to organise this. Right. So these sound like extraordinary technology. Is it something that, you know, the, a, a museum like yours owns one of these Oh, no, vehicles? we don't even own one in Australia. We don't have one at all. So this the, the recent one came from the Smith Ocean Institute and that's a philanthropic um, organisation in the US and they had a boat with this and it's coming around Australia and they basically put out tenders so anyone wants to join in. And so there are some scientists who want to look at rocks and others who want to look at sponges yeah. and you're, you're all vying for, right. exactly. for your role. We'll put our bids in all the time. No, stop, stop, stop grabbing that rock. Grab that sponge instead. <laughs> <laughs> and so once the, an interesting sponge has been found and hopefully is um, located and, and put safely inside that little ROV and it's then travelling up these thousands of metres from the ocean floor, how well do they survive the, the trip up to the surface? Yeah, well, the, the sponges, if, if they're put in a little capsule by themselves, they survive really well. I mean, some of the times when we do um, when we do the trawls and we bring up things like prawns and fish, you know, they're, they're, at, they're at like one or two degrees down there. So by the time you bring them up to the water column, they're like, they're like half cooked. Even though the water temperature is only 20 degrees, that's a lot more than one degree. Well, the sponges are, are, of course, meant to be deep, deep down in the ocean. Do they change the way they look as they come up to the surface? Oh, uh, no, they actually survive. These ones survive quite well because they they got a lot more glass in them, a lot more of the silicon spicules in their ones. Um, if they're brought up in a beam trawl, they obviously get mashed up. You know, they get hit by the prawns and fish and everything, and they they can be difficult to find. That's why a lot of the time they haven't really known about these things. And now we've got better technology. We can actually find a hot. We're finding so many more that we didn't know existed. Is that ROV able to take photographs as well, yeah, Merrick? Yeah, so you can see videos, what they look yeah. like in location? Yeah yeah, 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 that's exactly right. And that's 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 right because, as you say, they, they used to be mangled and now you can see exactly what it looked like. All the fragile fimbriae around the edge are all preserved. Yeah. Whereabouts have you used or have, have these ROVs been used to look for sponges? What parts of the ocean? Have you been able to peer down and, and see well, what's happening? Me personally, on the east and west coast of Australia, from everywhere from Tasmania up to um, the Coral Sea and things. And the ones that you've been involved with, Merrick, what kind of discoveries when it comes to sea sponges have been made through those oh, sorts yeah. of investigations? Oh, Do you oh. find much? Oh, yeah. Every time every time I go down, you know, I come back with a few kind of a sponge on one of the 
the bigger trips we went, found about 28, spe- 28 new species. That new is. species? New species, yeah. Well, how many species are known of, of sponges at the moment? Well, I know at the museum here, just in our collection here, we've got 5,000 morpho species of sponges. Probably about 900 have been described. So I've got over 4,000 sponges to sit down and describe. You shouldn't be here. You've got to get uh, back over there. Yeah, You've right. got quite the inbox, but, but <laughs> the intro. The problem is as soon as I, I go, yeah, I work on this one, I go, actually, it's not one there. It's actually five in there. Oh. So if you're finding new ones that are, that are being brought up from the ocean floor, do you get to name them? Is that yeah, Absolutely, yeah. Sarah's a good name. Have you thought that, of that? What do that you come up with? That is a possibility, with? yes. <laughs> what, what have you come up with? Well, I named one after MC Escher because I thought it was really funky. I named one after after my partner. I named one after my son and and a few other people that have been helpful along the way. And another soft coral artist named Opalus because it's got because it looks like opal under the microscope. Huh. Anyway, so. well, I think a conversation sea sponge would yeah. be a fitting conversation tribute. Sea sponge, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. But I mean, I guess it's not quite as simple as just pulling up something off the ocean floor and and christening it. How do you? go into identifying whether you have got a new species or what you've got, what kind of detective work happens once you've got a specimen? Yeah, yeah, it's a very long process. It's, it's better with the carnivorous sponges because, like I said, they, they were recently described and the only other previous ones were done with the Challenger Expedition in the 1800s and those guys did fantastically beautiful detailed descriptions and drawings but it's something like something between the 1920s and 1980s people got really slack and Wrote horrible descriptions. So. Really? Yeah. Science went down? Yeah, it did. It did in this area. They, they just go, oh, new species, new species, new species. And it's like, well, what a poor description. And But to describe a species, you have to eliminate all the other described species. So usually you have to get hold of what we call a type. When, you, when someone describes a species, they go, this one here is the actual one it's based on. And so you have to get hold of those. And like some of the, most of them, of course, went to Europe in the in the 1800s, early 1900s, even up until recently. And... Um, you know, these types um, got bombed by the Allies during the Second World War, so they don't exist anymore. So you've got this horrible description that you've got to try and match. Or some people, like Linnaeus, the original discoverer, he would he would famously write five words to describe a sponge. <laughs> and you go, that's not descriptive at all. It would be like, you know, green, brown, blobby, rough or something like that. And, and you go, how can I work against that? But I have to disprove that to prove it's a new one. So you have to get hold of these types. So you've got to track them down find them from around the world, then apply to the museums and they may loan it to you or they may not. And then then you have to get permission to, you've got to cut up a little tiny piece so you can look under a scanning electron microscope or, or, and they're too old to do DNA on it. So that's the other thing. You go, okay, well, if I go to that, that was collected from there. So if I go there now and I'll try and find one that matches the description and then I can get DNA out of that and then re, de- re-describe it again. So then I can then start moving on and re-describe. So sometimes it, in, Ends up being a family level dis- um, redescription. You're not no, not just a species, not just a do, genus, but higher up. That's on that, right. That, you have that to, chain. You have to get hold of all them and and re redescribe them all, and then you can go. Okay, now I know it's a new species. If someone's done a recent group, it's like carnivorous kind of ones. It's good because then you go. Okay, we know what's there now. It's much easier to plug in the new ones. So. How long can a process like that take? Five, ten years. Sometimes it can be more than that. I've got I've got a project for ten years and it's waiting on one holotype from. WA. It doesn't exist. It's from it WA. It, doesn't, it was from WA. It doesn't exist anymore. So I've been trying to find ones from WA that match it, but I haven't quite. So yet. you're like a detective with some cold cases. That's that exactly you, that right. You're just waiting to finish. It must feel amazing when you get to the end of that process and know for sure. It what is. You it found. is really good when you get that point. Yes. But it's also, it's one of those things exhausting after 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm done. And then it goes <laughs> to review for two years and it comes back to you and you go, oh. Um, that Maybe was so many... that's how Linnaeus felt, so he just wrote green, brown, <laughs> blob, possible. okay, enough. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned this Challenger expedition uh, a few times. Tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, well, they went around the world for two years on an old sailing boat and um, and they got this stuff from the bottom of the ocean. They must have put out like eight kilometres of piano wire. They piano used wire? Piano wire to get things off the bottom of the ocean. And then what, it would just be brought up in a great trawl of... Yeah, of but content. I'd imagine they... If they had piano wire, I imagine it probably would have been small boxes or whatever. But, yeah, but the thing they did was they just went and they produced these massive set volumes that you can still buy. They're hideously expensive, of course. They're super rare. But the the descriptions were so beautiful and painstakingly good drawings that, like I said, it's better than most people have done for the last 100 years. So it's easier to refer to that old stuff than the more recent stuff. So you love these sponges that eat other animals 
Are there any animals that eat sponges? Yeah. There's a, the hawksbill turtle is, eats a particular type of calcareous sponge, is well known for that. I think other animals like fish and turtles try and have nibbles at them, but um, that's one of the reasons why they've got lots of spicules in them and lots of um, chemical defences to discourage that sort of behaviour. Well, what, what kind of chemicals or how toxic can some sponges be? What sort well, of defences do they have? Um, they can be quite toxic. Um, I only know a few of them. I know there's one in particular, Nitrosia, that you, if you pick it up, you find a couple of days later, your, your hands will slowly just peel off the outer layer. Oh my god! Just, just, it's only small. It's not, it's not, it's not like a deep peel. It's just like a small peel. But anyway, just a flesh wound. But, but, but what from the chemicals? The just toxins from, the chemicals, from, just the from just from handling it for a few seconds. That's enough. But I, I don't advise eating them, and I haven't tried eating them, so I can't report on the toxicity of them. And so it's this kind of chemical compound that's interesting scientists who work on finding cures for human diseases. Yeah, that's is that, right. Is that yeah, a compound? Because sponges have the highest amount of bioactive compounds because they've got to do this competition to, to maintain their space and they can't, you know, physically uh, ward off a, uh, a fish that's trying to eat them as well. So that's one of the way, you know, they're, they're engaging in, they're trying to dissolve the coral next to them while the coral or algae is trying to dissolve them back. And so that, that's one of the reasons why they have so many bioactive compounds and the chemists love it because... And they're finding stuff for anti-cancer drugs, stuff for Parkinson's and pain-relieving drugs from these sponges. So. Do they, you know, spurt out these toxins or is it just if someone, if a little turtle or something else takes a hold of a, of a sponge, they'll get a shot of toxin? Um, probably a little bit of both, but mainly if something interacts with it because otherwise it'd be quite expensive just releasing Expensive chemicals. to the sponge, uh, you expensive mean? Expensive to the sponge, you know. <laughs> yeah. Another deep water sponge uh, are known as glass sponges. What do they look like? Yeah, glass sponges are very beautiful. They're, they're really deep and they have a lot of silicon down the bottom. They're very slow growing. But what they have, instead of these microscopic spicules, a lot of them have macroscopic spicules as well. And I said before, one up to a metre long. But um, most of them form really complex, almost like cages, and it looks like spun glass and it's just got a beautiful geometric pattern and there's one in particular called a venus a basket sponge which um is well known because prawns crawl into it and then they grow and then they become encaged in this thing they can't escape and japanese people give this as wedding gifts because it's uh it, it symbolizes partnership for life what it looks woven it looks like a wo finely woven glass cage and they live out their lives they there live out their lives there yeah what about if they, they reproduce? What happens to their babies? Well, the Is it like a little family? To, to, to float off into the ocean current. So. And they go and find their own they have to, yeah. glass sponge to yeah. live in. Yeah. How incredible. Mm. Those sponges, I mean, how long can they live for? I guess there are generations of different little shrimp or, or yeah. prawns that come in. How long does a sponge itself live for? We don't know. I mean, some what, of these... How do you not know this? Surely you can know that. Well... <laughs> We think some of these are thousands of years old and and some people have done some work on some sponges in caves and they've sectioned them and worked out that they're 10,000 years old and still alive. 10,000 years old? Yeah. This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Merrick, the sponges we've been talking about are found in seawater. How do some sponges make their way into freshwater? There's a particular family of sponges that just exist in freshwater. And these guys are quite funny because they produce these hardened cysts called gemmules. Then when birds feeding around the edge of a lake or whatever, they get stuck to their legs and they stay there for a long time. So you can get these ones that... that you know, you'll get annual migrations that might come from Siberia all the way to Australia and they'll be carrying these sponge spores with them and then they might take a different one back with them. So they... so I know it can be hard to draw causal lines in evolution, but what is that intentional? Like, is that deliberate or how does that happen? Is right. it just by chance that some sponge gets like a sticky note attached to a bird's leg and ends up somewhere else? Or is, is the sponge want, is the, it wanting to do that? Trouble? I think it's a sponge that has, has made these birds be their carriers. <laughs> that's a sponge-centred a sponge yeah. theory of, yeah, of right. evolution. <laughs> so 
sponges are animals, which we've established, even though they don't have brains. How do they reproduce? They've got lots of different ways of reproducing. Um, first off, there, there's asexual and there's two different ways. One is if you actually break a piece off a sponge, whether it's by a form or, I mean, by a, a storm or someone breaks it off with a, an anchor or something and it, it can happily drift away and it'll probably lodge on if it finds another susceptible place and, um, and grow from there. They also produce buds, another asexual way is producing little buds, and they also can produce, reproduce sexually in a couple of different ways. One is they do broadcast spawning, sort of like corals, the sperm and eggs are released into the water and they drift off and they've got to find each other and then settle down. Or they can internally fertilise and then they're bred inside um, and then they're released as little larvae that either swim or crawl. So, so they have a different lifestyle, same as us. I mean, I can't remember when I was a sperm and egg either. <laughs> <laughs> and the same sponges, can can the one kind of sponge reproduce these different ways or do different yeah. species do the different things? They can repro- Most of them can reproduce in, in several ways, but um, there are some that specialise. And the way that, you know, those extraordinary footage of, say, the coral spawning that happens over a few nights in the Great Barrier Reef, is it the same thing, the similar thing with sponges? Does it just happen on one night of the year or does it have a different rhythm? It has a different rhythm. We're not quite sure of them all yet. Some of them, I think some of them are seasonal like that, Some, but some also do it much more, th- much more often throughout the year. Yeah, they'll have, they're having different strategies. Yeah. What sort of risks are there for these creatures, which on the one hand sound incredibly resilient in that they've lived and survived and evolved over billions of years, but what what are the threats or are there threats to them in this current environment? Yeah, there are threats, but I think they will do better than corals. Yeah, I think they're going to be much more resilient to that sort of thing. Why is that? Um, Well, because corals and things like that rely on being in a particular height of the water column to get enough um, sunlight and they have a, a much narrower band of temperatures they can cope with. Where some of the sponges also have a zooxanthellae in them as well, and so those ones are, are more likely to be hit affected. But you can get sponges, some of them can cope with being out of the water at low tide, and that's not a problem. Most of them prefer to be in water, but they're pretty hard. Another issue with a lot of things in the sea thing is, is with the CO2 levels rising in the ocean. All this carbonate gets um, sucked out of living shells of things, so a lot of things like mollusks and that are going to suffer. They're going to have the carbon ripped out of their shell, but um, but sponges don't have that problem. Silicon doesn't seem to be changing too much at the moment, as far as I'm aware. What about dangers posed by fishing? Is that an issue for sponges? Yeah, or? they do get caught up a lot in trawls, but um, hopefully there's enough other spots for sponges. <laughs> sponges are a big part of how you spend your time at the museum and they're a big part of the collection. What else is there in that sessile marine invertebrate world that takes your fancy? Yeah, mate? well, at the moment, soft corals are just last week. I was up in Harvey Bay at the National Park, so help me. And we're doing some surveys there and going, going to an area I've never been before and look for soft corals. So soft corals are different from hard corals. They're what we call octocorals because they've got eight tentacles, whereas the hard corals, which most people think of when you say corals, have only six. So these guys are filter feeders as well. And these make the beautiful sea fans. Whenever someone does an underwater shot trying to promote something, you'll see a diver next to a sea fan. So that's one type. And the other type are what we, I tend to, people tend to think of soft corals that they might see in shallow waters, these leathery things going around. So, so yeah, so I'm describing new species. So last week I got very excited and, um, and found one up there. And, uh, and last night, about 8 o'clock last night, I was looking under the scanning electron microscope and, and I showed that it was the same as one I described from Cloundra here a few years ago. And, and that's the one I call Opalus because under the microscope, it, you can see it at low tide at Cloundra, you'll see it and it, it's all blue. And that's because all these microscopic, and we're talking about, you know, a thousandth of a millimetre in size, little blue opal looking structures in there. And I think, oh, I think they're, it's evolved to um, reduce the amount of sunlight coming in and when the sun gets too strong. So with these soft corals, what's driving you? What are, what are the things you're really hoping to find out with those? Oh, it's, it's the same, same thing as before. It's describing new species because these are a poorly understood group and they are very important and some of them do actually build reefs. They are a very important part of the ecosystem. And snorkels and scuba divers would know these, but... I challenge them to go up really closely, 
look for the polyps opening and closing because some of them some of them are quite large, and I'm talking here like a centimetre or so, and they, they're they like a little flower and they just open and close like every second you'll see them and they're fant- fascinating to watch. But if you get really close and look at the other ones that are about a millimetre in size and look for them doing the same thing too, it's fascinating. But scuba diving, people go, oh, look, there's a turtle and there's a fish and they race off after that. But they, if you stop... And look at something small, you'll see so much another level of movement and, and universe in there. And some people do go muck diving particularly because what it does, you, you can't see more than a couple of metres, but it forces, so it forces you to look close and you see all these life that you'd never noticed before. And the way you're describing it, 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 it sounds like it's so full of movement. It's not just a static thing that if you're moving quickly, it might just look like it's, it's not moving at that's, all. That's but exactly there's, right. Yeah, there's that's, constant movement. There is so much action on there. And it's so noisy down there too, people don't realise. There's all the clicking and... Yeah. Do, the, do the corals and sponges make noises? Or no. no, I'm thinking they're more like the, the baffles. They're the ones absorbing all the yeah, sound of exactly those right. yeah. <laughs> noisy creatures around them. I know that your heart belongs to these less heralded creatures of the deep, but you have also been involved, Merrick, with some bigger animals, with dugongs. I've only ever seen dugongs in the wild once. Why are they so hard to spot? Yeah, it, it's funny. They're, they, you can be two and a half metres long and weigh half a tonne, and I could be three metres away from you. I know you're there and you can't see them. They're very good at being secretive. They like slipping into the deeper, darker water very quickly. So but they can move fast despite they their can big move, size. They can sprint very fast, very quickly. Because what they'll do is they tend to like hanging out in deep water, but obviously they need the seagrass, which has got to occur in the shallow water to get the sunlight. And so at high tide, they'll come up onto the banks. And that's where most people will see it. And if they hear a boat noise or anything, of course, they're gone. They just race for the deep water and go down. But if you're out there in like a kayak or something and you're just dead still and quiet, sometimes you'll suddenly... Uh, hundred of them might come up around you. A hundred? Oh, yeah, you get them in, they occur in herds, especially in, yeah, they like hanging around very communal things. I know that um, there's the story goes that, that dugongs are what sailors used to mistake for mermaids, which surely is a, a speaks to the desperation of, of sailors because they are weird looking animals. I mean, they look like something that should be on the African savanna rather yeah. than the ocean. Yeah, well, that's right. They're related to elephants and you, don't, you can sort of see that once you, especially once you look at the skull and the, and the front of the face. And their tail is a is a different shape. Or tells us something about the yeah, evolutionary history. Yeah, that's right. Their horizontals, that? just like like dolphins and whales, because they were they were mammals. So they were they they were you know if we go for the we used to be fish, and at some point we moved up on the land, and then some of us went. You know what? I'm going back to the ocean, and so that's the <laughs> that's those guys like. Dolphins so and dugongs, yeah. Their tail was So their tail's used... horizontal, where if you think of all sharks and fish, they've got a vertical tail. Because it was used on land as yeah, a... Yeah, because uh, of, of we walked around on legs for a bit. <laughs> you take part in something that I think is referred to as a dugong rodeo. Yeah. Can you explain this? I don't want the RSPCA calling conversations. What on earth is a dugong rodeo? Okay, well, um, to do some scientific research on a dugong, we, we first find them in the herd and then we find one away that's on the edge of the herd and we try and get it peeled away. And then we actually try and get to have a run. That's a natural tendency and we we want to give them room to run. And so they have a run. When you say run, you mean swim. Swim, yeah, sprint. <laughs> but they're sorry. back on. They're, 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 they're really, go, they're really going on. for it. <laughs> you really have to go hard on the boat to keep up with them. But you've got to stay with, stay close to them. And so what we do, they come up and have a breath so every couple of minutes. So we try and get on the third breath and then they've started to build up a bit of lactic acid. And they take their, they come up, take a breath, and they put their head down and their back's arched. And at that point, two of us have to jump off at the same point and try and grab it around the back. And the second, the, the first two guys jump, another two jump off the front of the boat as well, and we've got to jump in front of it and grab a peck because the guys in the back, can you can hold a dugong, but you can only hold it for so long by yourself because it's, <laughs> it's a half-ton animal and it doesn't <laughs> want to be held. And so the other two, you have to grab it around the pecks to stop it from spinning because it, it, if it, it realises it can't throw you off, and, and a lot of times it will, um, its next tactic was usually to start spinning, spin. to spin you off. And so you need those people on the front to grab it as well. And sometimes you can, if you're like third or fourth jumper, you jump in the, you just have to jump in the white water at this point because you can't see anything. And then your head comes out from under the water, clear water, and either you're lucky and there's dugong with two people attached or there's a dugong with one person attached at high speed hanging on <laughs> and you try and grab them. Or if the dugong's gone, it's gone already and there's nothing in the water. <laughs> so 
And if you get on it, it's usually a 30 minutes heavy duty rinse cycle as it tries to throw you. <laughs> and then the dugong calms down and you all try and float to the surface. Meanwhile, you're holding your breath like you can't believe. My but, goodness, but we it's do like this ball like, catching. But I know, but, but, but it's dugong. actually, we do it just by using our hands and our body and we've got a wetsuit on so it's nice and soft on the dugong. Whereas when they do this overseas, they use nets and, um, and lassoes and things. And so it's really stressful the animal. And then we have it in the water and we do all the measurements just holding it in the water. So we don't have to take it to the boat. Once a year, we do health surveys. And at that point, we take some, take them in a, in a nice soft um, harness and we lift them onto the back of the boat and we do some other. That way we can take blood samples and things like that. What are you finding out from Dugon? What kind well, of tests? Well, first off, most of the in-water stuff we do is, is all about, A, working out how many um, Dugongs there were because we had no... You can do aerial surveys, but that's a rough estimate. And this one... You can take a DNA sample as well in the water and you can, so you measure them and you work out how long, how they're growing, their health and how they're reproducing. And now you've got the DNA markers and you can go, okay, you're the son of this one. And then, <laughs> and we're trying to work out, you know, whether the ones in Harvey Bay are different from Morton Bay and things like that. But when you do the health survey on the boat, you, you, you're taking blood samples and, and breathing samples because we don't know what a baseline is. I know if you go to the doctor and they say, oh, we'll take your bloods, you know, and they come back to, oh, your cholesterol's a bit over here or whatever. But for those animals, you've got no idea what, what is in a healthy range. So that was one idea to try and work out what's actually a healthy range for uh, these animals. Have you ever been taken for a ride on one in, in trying to catch one? Oh, absolutely. I remember once once in particular, I was still holding on to the animal and everyone else thought it had gone and they were sitting back on the boat. <laughs> and after about two minutes, I go, I can't hold my breath anymore. And then I came up on the boat's about 400 metres away and they're going, oh, where's Merrick? And they're all, they're all tucking into the sandwiches or something. <laughs> <laughs> I was still on the dugong waiting for someone to come and help me. <laughs> All this time, Merrick, that you spend in the ocean for your work, does that come from your days in Fiji? You spent years in Fiji as a little kid. Is that where you first fell in love with life well, under the water? Well, I, I'm not sure, but we certainly had exposure to it. Like we, we had a boat and my parents were very good at taking us out doing stuff. My brother and sister were older, so they got to do a scuba course and do all that, whereas my old man was too scummy to even buy me a mask. So I just used to have to dive in and open my eyes and swim around. <laughs> so I guess part of that got into the fa- you know, our family used to go camping and sort of got into outdoors. And it was really actually in grade nine, a friend of ours from school took me on my first bushwalk, and that really opened my eyes to the outdoor world. But I didn't really get into scuba diving until I was in, in Africa and we were just in Malawi and um, did and my partner did a diving course and so I thought, oh, I'll do more diving course. And then and Mal- Lake Malawi is um, full of cichlid fish. They're all mouth-breeding fish, so it's it's pretty cool for having diving. So I did a lot of diving. And then because I'd done my PhD in plant pathology in a different field. In plants? Yeah, I worked on plant diseases. and But by the time I finished writing my PhD, I, I went, oh, I've had a gut for that and I need to do something else. So I worked in an outdoor shop for a year and did wanted, bit, wanted to be brain dead for something. And then made documentaries anyway. And so then I came back and went, I thought, okay, I better get a job in my in my career. And I moved to Kansas as a plant pathologist. And I lasted three months and went, no, I'm going to Africa, going 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 holiday instead. And where else have you dived in Africa besides oh, Malawi? Yeah, well, Mozambique and... and What's that like? like? What what kind of creatures well, are there? It's really, really good there because it's going, uh, going out to look at the reef. And I was, oh, yeah, it was on the reef. But on the way there, they said, oh, some whale sharks, quick jump overboard. I went, that's so cool. And so I was in the water for 40 minutes and they're going, come on, we've got to go to a dive site. And they go, no way, this is so much better than a dive site. And so it was a big school of feeding um, whale sharks and, and they're just sitting around. How big are they, Merrick, to oh, swim near? Oh. <laughs> it's like swimming next to a truck or what, yeah, what is it? it? Pretty much. If they had big, sharp teeth, I'd be very scared. I wouldn't have been in the water. It's, yeah, they're like, they're so similar to a whale. But, um, yeah, at one point I've been in the water for 40 minutes and I was ignoring the dive master to get out of the water, but... One of the, the big bull shark, I think, was saying, oh, yeah, time for you to go. And he, he, had, he had his little harem of women there. So he came up and actually gen- gently just pushed me and did a big circle and came around and pushed me further away again. I went, okay, I, I got the hint. <laughs> so this PhD that you'd done in plants and, and plant pathology, how well did that set you up for understanding underwater life? Well, not so much for underwater life, but but on the other hand, you know, if you look at DNA and you're working on organisms and it gives you that scientific process, you understand exactly the same thing and you're going through the same thing, you know, in, in a way. 
It doesn't matter if it's a it's a feather from a bird or a thing. I mean, obviously, you've got to learn those groups as you come along, but you've got the same um, mindset, the same way of approaching it. Was it hard to break into marine biology, though? I imagine that's a competitive field for scientists. It was. And, and while I was an undergrad, that's right, everyone was doing this, and I went, oh, that's too competitive. So I didn't go there at all. And it was only later in life, sort of, my friend heard about this job, so he goes, Merck, here, apply for this job. And so I wrote an email to this guy, John Hooper, and said, oh, look, you've got time to um, come and have a chat about this job. And my friend, meanwhile, two weeks later, said it got me in the door and, and I went up and knocked on his door. And he goes, I was about to write you an email telling you I don't have time to, to, to see you, but since you're here. And so he took me around the collection and told me what they did and we had a really nice informal chat, which probably worked well for me because I'm horrible at formal, formal interviews. Well, there you go. That's the value of and that knocking got me in on the a door. door. Yeah. And so I did that for a year and then, then the collection manager retired and my boss said, you will apply for this job. <laughs> So then I got it and all these other friends who did marine biology, how did you get that job? <laughs> You're I a plant I must guy. have been at the right place at the right time. <laughs> and, and did sponges, had they already taken your um, interest by that stage? No, they hadn't. I knew nothing about sponges. I went for a dive at work and, and, and they said, all right, we're going to collect sponges because there are a few people working on sponges. Had a, had a big team at that time. I went, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, that's a sponge, that's a sponge. And so, yeah, just learnt, learnt on the job, yeah. You did just briefly mention... Merrick, that you'd done some film and documentary work yeah. back there. Yeah. You went to Mongolia and helped make one of the first reality TV programs. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, we... is a surprising thing to have on yeah. your CV. Yeah. How did that happen? What took you to Mongolia well, in the well, first friend, place? Well, a friend of ours, Sarah, said, I'm going on this adventure. And actually they had other people planned and one of them had to drop out because his work and so I got invited at the last minute. I went, yeah, sure, works ter- time beautifully. Forced me to write up the last bits of my PhD and then um, there's five of us. We rode, uh, rode bikes around and, and I designed a solar system to charge all the batteries because we didn't have any support vehicle or anything and we rode around Mongolia for a few months. For a few months? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What, what's it like to ride a bike in Mongolia? What are the roads like? <laughs> the roads are appalling. They're dirt roads and, and, and if someone, after a while, that gets too rutted, so they put another, someone just drives. There's all next to it, then, then another one. So you They end just up with make like, a new road. Uh, yeah, so there's like eight <laughs> parallel sets of tracks weaving across the crunchy side and because everyone there still rides horses which is fantastic so if anyone is to go i would say go over there with 300 dollars, buy yourself a horse and that horse gets tired you can just trade it in later for another horse and do that well how well did bicycles go on that kind oh, of terrain? our bicycles were breaking down all the time we had so many spares and ended up you know finding bits of wire on the side of the road to keep them together so and what did the locals what did the mongolians think of this bunch of australians oh, i thought it was great yeah because they horse riding and and they'd come and join you. I remember one day, particularly, there was a guy on a horse, and he was, and we were, we were sort of trading things, and it was like we were leaning over trying to pick up rocks, and he was showing that how he's riding on his horse, and basically goes almost under the horse and whilst galloping, and picks a rock up from the ground because they're incredible horse archery people. Yeah, no, they're so friendly. You know, you might set up a tent because over there, it's no one used to own the land. I think it's all changed now, and then you could just camp anywhere. So we just ride and go. Oh, that's enough for the day. Well, there's a creek, let's camp by that. And um, and someone will see you from like two kilometres away. And they get on their horse and be carrying a pot of boiling tea in one hand while they gallop over and just come and give you some tea. And they're just, they're just really nice. They just sit next to you, maybe lean against you and just observe. Don't say anything. Just watch what you're doing and you might share some peanuts or something. And then after a while, they'd go off. And... You were like some fascinating carnivorous sponge that yeah. had just appeared in their, yeah. in their landscape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you were filming, though. It wasn't just a holiday. Yeah. And, you know, reality TV has become marked by dramas that yeah, happen yeah. interpersonally uh, on screen. Was there... Was there stuff happening within the group? Because it sounds like conditions might have been pretty challenging. Yeah, it was. It's tough on bodies as well. We're all falling off our bikes and getting injuries. And so it's it was very physically demanding. I mean, Lonely Planet years ago said, no, Mongolia is not for cycling except for the absolute masochists. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's so drama. Tempest, so people, Tempest Frayed, what kind of things yeah, happened? Yeah, well, people get really tired and then um, and some people wanted to end the trip, but they didn't want to say that I've, I've had enough of riding the bike. They wanted to say, oh, my bike's broken, so I can't go anymore. There was one particular day, it was a really hot day because we had a hottest summer and the coldest summer and both within a few weeks of each other there because summer only lasts three months of the year there. Then, it, then it's all snowed out so you can't get across. Anyway, we, we arrived at this guy and he had a fridge which was just unbelievable there and he had these amazing glass bottles of drink and they didn't have a label or anything and they were all different. They were, they were like, sort of like lemonade but the best soft drink I've ever tasted in my life, really subtle strawberry and blueberries and things like this. 
And and I, Tim and I got there first and, and we discovered it. So we're drinking and go, how good is this? And so when the others arrived, I said, yeah, have this, drink this. And someone go, oh, I want to pay for it. And I go, no, no, it's so good. It's my shout for today. And and rather than going, oh, thanks, that goes, oh, and threw down the bottle and jumped on a bike and stormed off and goes, I can't talk to you anymore. It's like the real housewives of Mongolia. So, so, <laughs> so yeah, different things happen. And I think because we were doing that, um, talking to the camera, people were venting to a camera and not discussing, hey, this is upsetting me or whatever. And they'd think you felt like you'd discussed it to everyone, but no one else knew because we weren't allowed to review or look at tapes or anything. Anyway, that's what the TV station loved. They loved that drama, so it got really played up. So did you eventually create a film out yeah, of all yeah, of this? Yeah, yeah, it was on World Around Us and it went on Discovery Channels. So although you were relatively late to at least looking at the underworld, underwater world scientifically, how much has changed in the time that you've been spending um, periods of time underneath looking at, at corals and looking at sponges? Yeah, even in since I've been a marine biologist, I've seen it change. Like I went to the Coral Sea just last year and I went to the same spot in 2009 and we'll do this dive site and it was called Amazing. And we know, oh, yeah, that's what someone's called it. Anyway, it's a particular spot. And we went in and you're just basically going along a little sort of channel and there are all these great soft corals that are like a metre high and they're bright red and greens and yellows and there's so much life. And we all just did it and the sharks and fish and corals and everything. And we all came out and we went, wow, that was amazing. I could see why it's called Amazing. And when I went back last year, unfortunately, it's almost all dead. It's really sad. And that was out in the Coral Sea where we were hoping that because it's a long way from human influence and it might be protected by the deep water currents, but obviously that's not the case. So that's very sad. Merrick, thank you so much for introducing us into some of your world today. Thank you for being my guest on Conversations. Pleasure, Sarah. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Sarah Kanoski. For more Conversations interviews, head to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.